an 11-year-old schoolboy gunned down on his way home from football training. It taunts me and it will continue to do so. Just Reese Lyon there, the pool of blood. It was a crime that shocked Britain. This was the murder of a child in broad daylight. It would have outraged and appalled the community. Reese Jones could have been anybody's son, anybody's friend, anybody's brother. And for months, a case that seemed impossible to solve. The police may have known who killed Reese. They were a very, very long way away from proving it. So what were the vital clues that helped police catch Reese Jones's killer? Amazingly, somebody did recognise it. They took the bike straight to the police. They were faced with witnesses too terrified to give up the killer in their midst. I know people must be frightened, but they've got to think that they can't leave this killer out there. It's all well and good naming somebody, but unless you want to give a witness statement, it's good intelligence. The problem is they have no evidence. With no sign of the gun... The recovery of the murder weapon in any murder investigation is obviously a, a critical aspect. A lack of forensic evidence. The fingertip search failed to recover any of the rounds or the cartridge cases. And a gang war that was threatening to explode at any moment. And it's all about territory. You've only got to be on the wrong side of one street for them to take some form of action against you. Investigators had a painstaking job to solve the crime. So if you can figure out who the intended victims are, you can work out who it is that might want to shoot them. Tonight, the secret recordings that proved vital during the investigation. The covert listening devices have provided confirmation that these two young men are involved. The expert witness who was able to break the gang's code of silence. We'll normally be talking in terms of likelihoods about whether the criminal and the suspect are in fact the same person. And the senior detective who helped bring the killer to justice. We can't afford to be overwhelmed by the circumstances. That investigation had to be done and had to be done properly. It was one of Britain's biggest ever murder investigations and one of the most daunting police have ever faced. The challenge was getting the right evidence that was going to not just get an early charge, but secure a conviction. As they search for the clues that caught the killer. <laughs> Liverpool, the 22nd of August, 2007. At 7.30 in the evening, 11-year-old football fan Rhys Jones is walking home from training. He crosses a car park a few hundred metres from his home. He's walking home near a pub and somebody comes up nearby, lets off three rounds from a gun and Rhys is shot. Steve Gagan was Reese's football coach. That evening, he'd offered him a lift home after training. But Reese wanted to walk. My son Sean was sitting next to me in the car. Um, we just set off literally a couple of yards and Sean screamed Reese's name. And I looked over to me right and Reese hit the floor. It haunts me for the rest, of the, and, it, and it will can, continue to do so. Um, just Reese lying there, the pool of blood. Steve immediately called 999. The news was broken to Reese's mum and dad. I got a knock at the door to come and it was Reese's football chain and manager to tell me that Reese had been shot. Reese's parents rushed to the scene. His mum, Mel, cradled him. Can you imagine a more heartbreaking and horrific experience to befell anybody? Paramedics spent more than an hour trying to save Reese's life. He was taken to nearby Alder Hay Hospital, but died a short time later.
no matter what people say to me, I know I couldn't have done anything about it. Do you know what I mean? I know that, but I can't convince myself of that. Because um, Reese was in my care at the time. Former Detective Chief Superintendent Sue Hill has investigated dozens of murders. Like the rest of the country, she was shocked by Reese's senseless killing. It doesn't matter how long uh, you're a police officer, when you hear about a little boy that dies in tragic circumstances like that, it's a real shock to each and every one of us. It's every parent's worst nightmare. Your child, you know, this little boy isn't 12 years old yet. With Reese's killer at large, an armed response unit was sent to the scene. The pub car park was cordoned off and the hunt for evidence began. Jane Monkton Smith is a forensic criminologist who advises police how to collect and preserve vital clues. In a serious crime like this, the first thing that the police are going to have to do is a crime scene lockdown. And that means that they, they stop that crime scene getting contaminated by anyone or anything. As soon as you arrive, you've know you've got that kind of immediate, those immediate actions that need to happen. They have to be done really quickly because you could lose evidence. There's a crucial window of time that can make or break any murder inquiry. If key clues can't be found in the first few hours after a crime, the chances of solving it are reduced. You need to secure the scene, secure witnesses, find CCTV. Did anyone see anything? Was there any clue, any witnesses? And you need to do all that in really, really short, fast time frame. As the search for clues began, former detective Chief Superintendent Brian McNeil was one of the senior officers assigned to the case. There were hopes it could be solved quickly. In any investigation, the clock is ticking with regards to how you're going to carry that investigation forward. You've got to look at CCTV. Is there any in the area? If there is, it needs seizing as soon as practicable so you can start to examine it and get it enhanced if needs be. Before detectives had a chance to scour any security camera footage, they were about to secure their first major clue. The time and location of the shooting offered the possibility of a quick resolution to the case. There were three shots fired. People would have turned, people would have looked. So there were witnesses, and witnesses were able to tell the police exactly what it looked as it had happened. So there was young men on a bicycle, and one of them had a gun and was shooting. So the police really knew straight away what they were dealing with. As a former detective chief superintendent, Colin Sutton is an expert in piecing together the vital clues police need to convict murder suspects. The witnesses had told the police the gunman was wearing a dark hoodie. One slightly unusual aspect, I suppose, of, of this crime was that it was a nice summer's evening. He had too many clothes on, really. He almost looked as if he was overdressed, probably overdressed on purpose to try and hide his identity and possibly even with a view to disposing of his outer clothing and getting rid of forensic evidence. Detectives had their first breakthrough, a description of the likely killer. The motive for the murder was a mystery, but a theory had very quickly emerged. Journalist Greg O'Keefe was on shift that evening at the Liverpool Echo. He was one of the first reporters to get to the scene. There was suggestions flying around that it had been a gang-related shooting. Then pretty quickly, after being there for about an hour or so, something close to it, the real narrative began to come out. It was obvious that the person who had been shot was completely innocent. In the hours that followed, hundreds of police officers searched for any physical evidence that might help. A fingertip search was conducted of the immediate area around, uh, and that is literally officers on hands and knees looking at the ground to find things. One of the most important things to find were the bullets. There was a car that was damaged by one of the bullets. You've got the potential for ballistic forensic recovery. What bullet went where? Where can we get the evidence from? 
Peter Blexley is a former detective who spent over 20 years hunting some of Britain's most notorious killers. In a case where a firearm's been used, it's very helpful if you can recover a bullet or a spent bullet casing. That might give you a clue as to what kind of weapon was used. You might also get DNA from it, for example, which might actually let you know who pulled the trigger. But the search for the bullets proved fruitless. The fingertip search failed to recover any of the rounds or the cartridge cases. Uh, and that would have been you know, quite a blow, really, quite an early blow to the investigation, because you w would want those because the, of the potential that they would give you to, to, to find out what had gone on. The search of the crime scene also failed to turn up the gun. The recovery of the, of the murder weapon in any murder investigation is obviously a, a critical aspect of the investigation and the, any forensic link to your offender or offenders uh, in order to establish the prosecution case is uh, a crucial aspect of any court trial and investigation stage. The failure to find any bullets or the murder weapon was a setback. But police had quickly come up with a theory that Rhys had been hit by a stray bullet, innocently caught up in a turf war between rival gangs. This was the murder of a child in broad daylight. This would have frightened the community. It would have outraged and appalled the community. It would have got the attention as well of the media, certainly. They probably got pressure from the highest levels. Get this solved. You've got to sort this out. We can't afford to be overwhelmed by the circumstances. We can't afford to be overwhelmed by the massive press and media interest or interest of government level that was coming into the force at the time. The fact is, we've got to do the investigation. And the investigation for Reese's mum and dad, for his brother, for Reese himself, and you know everybody else, the communities, the wider society as a whole, that investigation had to be done and had to be done properly. In the hours following the shooting, police made early arrests, but no one was charged. You've got a child that's been killed. You've got a family you need to help. You've got the community. Everybody wants this murder solved. We cannot have an 11-year-old on our streets being murdered and gunned down when he's on his way home. The team must have been under immense pressure to get the result, to find the gunman and to solve who killed Bruce Jones. Scrutiny on the case was growing by the second, as the hunt for clues to catch Rhys Jones's killer intensified. Jones, the city of Liverpool, and indeed the whole country mourned the 11-year-old's death. The pressure on detectives to uncover the clues that would solve the case grew stronger. Every crime that we deal with has got a victim, at whatever level that is. Um, and there are cases that every police officer can look back over their service and say that was particularly pulled at the heartstrings because of the circumstances of the victim or the circumstances of the offence. Police were still searching for the murder weapon and any forensic evidence. Eyewitnesses had described seeing the gunman riding a bike and wearing a hoodie, but no one had been able to identify him. I need more help in the solving of this crime. The answers to who is responsible is within the community. The day after his murder, Reese's parents made a courageous and heartbreaking appeal for help. Someone knows who's done it. And I know people must be frightened, but they've got to think that they can't leave this killer out there. It could be their son, could be their brother, next time. Because it'll happen again. If he's not caught, it'll happen again. My baby was only 11. He didn't deserve this. This is a very, very traumatic thing to, to put a family through, especially a family that have just lost a child. 
But this really adds that kind of human interest element to the media coverage of this story. And the police hope this is going to jog somebody's conscience. There's somebody out there that knows who's done it. You know, somebody knows that, you know, who's got the gun or whatever it is or what they've done with it, you know, and you know, they've, they've got, got to come forward. They've got to come forward because, it, it, you know, it's beyond words. The captain of Everton Football Club, Phil Neville, also joined the appeals. We all here at Everton have families of our own and we cannot comprehend what you're going through. We appeal to anyone with any information to please contact the police. By now, police have been able to analyse the CCTV from the Fir Tree pub. It confirmed witness statements. Vitally, it also showed the government's movements around the time of the shooting. Another important clue in the hunt for the killer. It did a number of things. It corroborated what the witnesses were saying. It showed that the assailant was on a bike and the pictures were good enough to get quite a few details about the colour and the shape and the style and the type of bike that it was. The footage yielded other important clues. The CCTV also showed people that the police thought were the intended victims of the gunman. So if you can figure out who the intended victims are, you can work out who it is that might want to shoot them. The gangs, the gang rivalries, who's in those gangs. That's very good intelligence. In the area at the time, there did exist a gang issue between those based in Croxteth and those based in Norris Green, and we had had previous shooting incidents. It's all about territory. They're very territorial, these individuals. You, you've only got to be on the wrong side of one street for them to take some form of action against you. And I think that's what happened in this case. The people who fired the shots didn't have any fear of the consequences at all. In the hunt for Reese's killer, police could now focus their attention on local gangs, in particular, the notorious Croxteth crew. That's a huge step forward because you're then, rather than looking at the whole of Liverpool or the whole of the UK, you can narrow down and focus in on this gang. The challenge for police would be getting gang members to talk. There is a code of silence um, both within and between criminal gangs. The people involved in gang activity have got to follow the gang's rules. And one of those rules is no grassing. You, you don't tell the police anything under any circumstances. And if you break those rules, then look out. Because these kind of individuals have absolutely no hesitation in taking somebody out, in killing them, if, if they have broken the rules of the gang. Police believe someone must have known the identity of Reese's killer, and they kept hearing one name. The police are inundated with information from the local community, and the same name keeps coming up time and time and time again. Sean Mercer. This name kept cropping up. Mercer, Mercer, Mercer. And it was unusual because they weren't just saying, this could be someone involved. People were saying, this is who shot Reese Jones. Callers to an anonymous hotline also claimed Mercer had an accomplice. There was another name that also came up time and again. That was James Yates, and he was being suggested as the person who'd supplied Sean Mercer with the gun. So at this point, you've got two named suspects for the detectives to concentrate their efforts upon. Police now had strong suspects but the investigation was a long way from over. It's all well and good naming somebody, but unless you want to give a witness statement, it's good intelligence. The problem is they have no evidence. Callers were reluctant to go on the record. It's entirely understandable that people might not want to give their names. The gang culture at the time was frankly out of control. Guns were being used far too often. And so people were afraid to put their hands up and say, this is me, I'll tell you what I know. Police started digging, looking for clues in the background of their prime suspect. 
when they have that name, Sean Mercer, they want to find out more about this individual. What is his history of behaviour? Has he been arrested before? Does this fit with the, the type of activity he's involved in? So they start gathering and collating the intelligence that they already have about him. Mercer had built up a reputation in the local community as a violent thug. He had an ASPO for threatening staff at a local sports centre. And the police had stopped him over 80 times. He was also a leading member of the Croxteth crew. He fitted the profile and he looked like the person in the CCTV. So they clearly had a very good suspect. Police then received further intelligence that led them to make arrests. Just days after Reese's killing, they made a coordinated swoop to detain several people, including Mercer and Yates. The police were hoping, under interrogation, one of the gang members would break ranks and offer up clues to what might have happened. But they would be disappointed. All the people that had been arrested were interviewed by the police. And guess what? No comment, no comment, no comment. Or here's a prepared statement in which they denied any involvement. Deeply frustrating for a detective. They didn't actually get very much evidence from those interviews. That's really a point for the police where they, they haven't managed to get the evidence they need to charge. You can't charge somebody unless you have sufficient evidence to take the case to court. It was becoming clear the murder of Reese Jones could take a lot longer to solve than first thought. With the lack of a confession, police were even more desperate to locate the three clues that could now catch the killer. The gunman's bike, his clothes, and most importantly, the murder weapon. So the police are a very long way away from charging and convictions. There's a very big difference between knowing something and proving something. The police may have known who killed Reese. They were a very, very long way away from proving it. Summer 2007, the country was reeling from the horrific murder of Reese Jones. This was the murder of a child, an 11-year-old boy coming home from football practice who got killed in broad daylight in an ordinary place in Liverpool. In the days after Reese's death, police had been overwhelmed with anonymous calls, potential clues all pointing to the same suspects. There was one name the police couldn't escape, Sean Mercer, a prominent member of the Croxteth crew. Sean Mercer's name came into the investigation very early. Uh, lots of people were saying it was Sean Mercer. However, a uh, name is one thing, evidence is another. That isn't, isn't evidence. It's not going to give us grounds to charge. But what it certainly does is give you a lot of background information around looking at how to investigate and giving you lines of inquiry. And at that stage, that intelligence was of sufficient amount for us to make arrests. But despite hours of interviews, detectives weren't able to extract any useful information from any of the suspects. Nobody confessed, so they weren't that much further forward. The group had closed ranks and were sticking closely to their gang code. It becomes quite clear that there's a certain level of arrogance within this group of young people. They feel pretty much untouchable, they feel protected. The young person who pulled the trigger the young person who supplied the gun and the people around them, including some of the parents, all closed ranks and they all conspired to thwart the police investigation. Police had also searched the suspects' houses, looking for any evidence in connection with the murder. They knew what they were looking for because from the CCTV and from the witnesses, they were looking for certain clothes, they were looking for a gun, they were looking for ammunition, they were looking for this bike. Forensically, 
in, in a shooting, what you do get is glowback of all sorts of gases and chemicals, various things, not only just on the sleeve, but also on most of the clothing. So if they were able to get that hoodie back that the assailant was wearing, and it hadn't been kind of washed several times and put into chemicals and things, then there was a likelihood that whoever was wearing that had shot a gun, which, if you're looking at teenagers, is you know, pretty unusual. Unfortunately, the police didn't find the gun. With the suspects keeping their code of silence and no murder weapon found, the police had to release them. The public was starting to become frustrated. The killer's name was even painted on a wall by a graffiti artist. The police now are under huge pressure because the public are saying, you know who killed Reese. what are you doing about it? Why aren't they charged? Why aren't they going to court? Having interviewed people executing search warrants, we then were in a situation where we had to bail them to allow for further police inquiries. And this is where it started to build expectation particularly within the media and the press, it's got to be said, well, everyone knows who's done this. It's on social media, word on the streets in the local community. It, it, this name is all being pushed around. Yes, it might be, but it's not evidence. As detectives battled to build their case, Reese's parents said goodbye to their son. It was indescribably sad watching his, his little blue coffin being carried out of the church. Merseyside police face national pressure to solve his murder. Quietly and behind the scenes, we're working to control and eliminate wherever possible guns in some of the communities in the country where the guns have been all too prevalent. We will do everything in our power to bring to justice the person who was responsible for the murder of their son. I've never known such a groundswell of intense attention from a city on an investigation, um, and I've covered other you know, high-profile murders in Liverpool. You've got politicians, you've got community groups, you've got pressure coming from all sides, and in amongst that, you have to make the decisions that are going to get you to the answer and get the evidence. The challenge was getting the right evidence that was going to not just get an early charge, but secure a conviction. They couldn't take the risk that these people were going to walk out the dock and laugh in the face of justice. Led by Mercer, the gang were organised and unified. Cracking them was going to be extremely difficult. He had to get rid of any evidence that would link him to the shooting of Reese, And he did it fairly systematically. And they, as loyal gang members do, answered the call. In garages, they found evidence, of police, of petrol cans. And it looked as if that was where clothing had been burnt. And probably Sean Mercer went there post the murder, and that's where they got rid of the physical evidence of his clothing. But equally, it just showed how much savvy and how much planning that Sean Mercer had after the murder to make sure the police were never gonna find any physical evidence. Unbeknown to the gang, detectives have been working behind the scenes to secure a breakthrough. The clues they required to catch the killer. They bugged their houses. Stroke the genius. The use of covert techniques in any investigation has obviously got to be carefully thought through because we've got to establish why other methods might not work, what we've done so far in the investigation, why it's justified. And the big question is proportionality because it's got to be proportional to the offence under investigation. Professor Peter French is a forensic speech scientist. He prepared the vital audio evidence for the prosecution. What my lab was asked to do was to transcribe those recordings to get down a very detailed and comprehensive record of what was said and who said what to whom. What we will do is we'll examine the recordings and we'll normally be talking in terms of likelihoods about whether the criminal and the suspect are in fact the same person. With a lack of physical evidence, police were hopeful that this tactic could provide invaluable information. What the police were doing was trying to, to strengthen their case, to build a bigger case against the defendants, and they were looking for material that might implicate them, either individually or um, collectively, in, in the crime. Covert listening devices can sometimes throw up the most valuable evidence because people are in their homes, they're relaxed, they're talking freely, and they do not suspect that their every word is being listened to.
There are lots and lots of difficulties with recordings of this time. I mean, it's not a fixed conversation with only two people involved. People are joining the conversation, they're dropping out, they're talking over one another, there are background sounds, a whole range of things like that. Among the hundreds of hours of recordings, analysts were able to pick out a series of damning conversations and a raft of new clues emerged. From the device which is in James Yates' house, they get something which is really useful. James is talking to his father about whether Mercer is actually going to tell the police that James gave him the gun, and James is confident that that won't happen. So this is massive because you've got, from the horse's mouth, you've got not only the fact that Sean, Sean Mercer is the shooter, by implication, but also the fact that James Yates supplied him the gun. So, effectively, the two names that kept coming up in the anonymous information into the incident room right at the very beginning, the covert listening devices have provided confirmation, and confirmation that can be used in evidence, uh, that these two young men are involved. But it was other conversations which gave detectives even more vital clues. They revealed actual details of the murder and the cover-up. For a gegen haar had James van Gupten, de donker stok en trouwens een hertsel. Maar ze wil hier nog een stok in doen. Had ze een stok in haar thuis. Wat heb je nou slecht van kunnen weten? Wat heb je nou slecht van kunnen weten? Als je wanneer het doos... Ik zeg wel even zo sterk, zie je? These recordings, along with fresh intelligence, gave police a major new lead. Approximately five weeks after the murder of Rees, we received reliable intelligence um, with regards to the murder weapon. It led detectives to the home of a new suspect, a local teenager who wasn't part of the gang and for legal reasons has never been named. The lad became known as Boy X in the prosecution. There was another name now, and this was an opportunity for the police to go to Boy X and have a look and find that gun. Boy X had been used by the gang to keep the gun somewhere safe, uh, unattributable to any of the gang members where it wouldn't be found by the police. Police launched a raid on Boy X's home. It gave them potentially the most important piece of evidence so far, another vital clue. So the suspect has held that murder weapon. There could be traces of their DNA on it. And they'll also be able to match up the wound that Reese experienced with a particular type of bullet that could be discharged from that firearm. So the police find the gun in the loft and they think it's the murder weapon. But there was a problem. Initial reports suggested the gun they found couldn't have caused the wound inflicted on Reese. They also find the ammunition but these two things are not compatible. They're not the bullets that you would usually put in that gun. The initial thought of the scientists with regards to this was that the, the caliber of the gun in question was .455. It transpired that the ammunition that was found with the gun was .45 in diameter, which means there was a .005 difference, and a bullet from that wouldn't have made what was then believed to be the entry wound at the front of Reese's neck. So initially, the scientists were putting a question mark, if you like, with regards to whether that was the actual weapon. Far from being the crucial clue to catch Reese Jones's killer, the fact that the gun, the bullets, and the wound didn't match was another huge setback. What the police had to do was establish whether this was in fact the gun. They didn't want to just rule it out. A ballistic expert got the gun, loaded it with the ammunition that was found in Boy X's loft, and test fired it. And what he found was that it didn't fire properly. Because of the mismatch between the calibre of the ammunition and the calibre of the gun, instead of the bullet going head first, like it should do, it tumbled end over end. It was a discovery that was recreated in dramatic detail in the critically acclaimed ITV drama, Little Boy Blue.
when they test fired that gun with the ammunition and when that was looked at with regards to Reese's injuries it turned out that it made a specific type of wound because the bullet was actually sideways and it was the wound found on the back of Reese's shoulder. What you normally get with gunshot wounds is you get a small entry wound and a larger exit wound. What happened in Reese's case was the reverse. Because he'd been hit by a tumbling bullet, the entry wound was the large wound, and somehow the round, it seemed, had strained itself up inside his body and it made a smaller exit wound. So in fact, they were looking at it the wrong way round. So that established that this actually was the entry wound and this was the exit wound. And crucially, that ammunition in that gun could and indeed did cause Reese's injury. This was a huge breakthrough. With the murder weapon secured, detectives now had to get the information they needed to prove Mercer's guilt. And Boyex was key to this because he was given the gun by Mercer. But the problem being that Boyex was vulnerable, intimidated, family intimidated, and scared of repercussions. Without the evidence of Boyex, the case could collapse. So, in the face of immense public pressure, police took an unprecedented step. Police were piecing together the vital clues in the murder of 11-year-old schoolboy, Rhys Jones, an innocent victim of gang violence. Merseyside police had prime suspect Sean Mercer in their sights. They'd recovered the murder weapon, hidden in the loft of a teenager later referred to during the trial as Boy X. He was arrested on suspicion of possession of the firearm that had been recovered from his attic when he returned from holiday the Saturday after we recovered that gun. It became clear that he knew something. He knew where that gun had come from and he could probably place it in Mercer's hands. He was almost a victim himself in this. He'd been picked upon by this gang to do their dirty work by looking after and hiding this gun for them. He hadn't chosen to do that. He'd felt he couldn't say no. Boy X was in a really, really difficult position. He would have been frightened um, of telling tales, grassing. It's not done in, the, in those gang cultures. But in order to secure the conviction of Sean Mercer, investigators employed groundbreaking tactics. What the police did was, in, in my view, absolutely the right thing to do, but slightly controversial. They went to the Crown Prosecution Service. They said, we would like to use Boy X as a witness, giving him immunity from the serious crimes to which he's admitted. The legislation that allows the offer of immunity to an individual in any circumstances had only come in in 2005. If granted, it would be the first time immunity had been offered to a witness under the age of 18. The strategy had the potential to crack the case wide open. It was from November to April that we were waiting for that decision on whether we could offer Boy X immunity. It's not something that happens overnight. Although it's all laid out, there are steps and it has to go through layers of CPS, Crown Prosecution Service, management, and then all the way up. Eventually, the decision's made at sort of Attorney General level. People of Liverpool were frustrated that Mercer was free to roam the streets. People were just thinking, well, they know the name, they know who's done it. Why hasn't he been charged? You know, people wanted to see justice, and they wanted it then. During the investigation, videos of the gang had begun to surface on social media. What they turned up in this case were these sort of bragging, arrogant little video clips with guns and with money and showing, you know, we're wannabe gangsters, really. They can access guns and clearly very arrogant and confident and no doubt they could use that gun to kill. Police gained intelligence from the videos. They placed Mercer in the middle of a gun-obsessed gang culture. And there was kind of a network and really proved the, the membership and the existence of the gang. As police waited to see whether they could use Boyex's evidence, the final clue came to light. The bike ridden by Mercer when he shot Reese had never been found. Two months after Reese's killing, police made a televised appeal. The bike was almost the last piece of the jigsaw that's missing. The appeal was really worth doing because, you know, if, if you can find it, there's, only, there's not going to be thousands of these bikes identified. The bike had been dumped after Reese had been shot and found by an unwitting member of the public. 
Amazingly, somebody did recognize it. They had found it kind of abandoned not long after Reese had been killed. But as soon as they saw the appeal, they took the bike straight to the police. Fantastically, the police were able to get some DNA off that bike. They then had that golden nugget of detail, that evidence, linking Sean to the bike. Weeks later, police were told Boy X could be given immunity from prosecution and therefore give evidence. This was the breakthrough the investigators had been waiting for. All of the pieces of the puzzle are starting to lock together to, to form what is going to be a very strong case. They have the bike, they have the gun, they have the audio recordings. There is a realistic chance of a conviction. Detectives now had all the clues and the evidence they needed to bring the killer of Rhys Jones to justice. It was very nearly case closed for the investigation. The house of cards started to fall down. They were able then to start charging the accomplices, to break the conspiracy, to set people against each other. And they ended up charging a lot of um, Mercer's accomplices. In this particular case, it's fair to say that we were confident that what we had and what we were going to present to the court, we were hopeful we were going to get the guilty verdict. Mercer appeared alongside six of the Croxtis crew gang at Liverpool Crown Court. Their questionable conduct was in full view of the jury and Reese's parents. You became increasingly horrified by the behaviour of the people who were who were up in the dock. They were making faces at each other, they were laughing and joking, they were chucking paper planes around. The gravity of their situation was just not registering with them at all. The behaviour of the gang was frankly disgraceful. They were utterly disrespectful of the court and more importantly, Reese's family. They took somebody's life, they took a mum and dad's son away from them. How could you, anyone show that much disrespect to the parents and friends and family? And uh, it's, it's just beyond me. On the 15th of December, 2008, Sean Mercer was found guilty of the murder of Rhys Jones and sentenced to life behind bars with a minimum of 22 years. James Yates was found guilty of assisting an offender and supplying Sean Mercer with the murder weapon. Yates received seven years and mocked the court. He was expecting a lot longer. The prosecution appealed his sentence as they felt it was too lenient. The seven years was increased to 12. Other people on trial also received jail sentences for assisting Mercer. Melvin Coy was sentenced to seven years for helping Mercer evade police capture. Gary Kayes was also sentenced to seven years for destroying evidence. Dean Kelly, who provided the fake alibi and also hid the gun in Boy X's loft, received four years. Nathan Quinn got two years for helping to dispose of the murder weapon and Mercer's clothes. In total, there were 11 people convicted of serious offences. Sean Mercer's mother and James Yates' parents were all convicted of telling lies to help their sons. They wanted to ensure that all of them went down because that would send a really strong message out to everybody involved in any kind of criminal activity in this area. It was the right verdict, it was the right result. I'm not saying that that result brings any form of comfort to Reese's mum and dad, his brother, or comfort to anybody, but it, it was the correct result, um, and that's, that's the way it should be viewed. It's fair to say that Sean Mercer has shown no remorse whatsoever. Nothing can bring Reese back, but we hope his family finds some peace from the fact that justice has been done. Over the months we have found strength in the messages of support from many thousands of strangers around the world. Eleven years on from the trial, everyone who was sent to prison has now been released, except for Sean Mercer. He remains in Franklin Prison, alongside other notorious inmates, including Soham Killer, Ian Huntley, and the murderer of Millie Dowler, Levi Belfield. It was a senseless murder. An 11-year-old boy who was simply walking home on a summer's evening. It was a crime that shocked us all, and a case that might never have been solved, but for the painstaking investigation by detectives. 
and the vital clues that caught the killer. Next Wednesday at 10, Channel 5 reveals the vital breakthrough that brought justice for Sadie Hartley in another Clues That Caught a Killer. Stay with us for the drama premiere next. The true story of the girl in the box, the kidnapping of Colleen Stan, is after the break. Thank you.